there are some basic distinctions that we have to make. Okay? In uh, some European languages, you have ethics as a concern about what is right and wrong in behavior. And then you have a word, deontology, which really concerns best practice in a profession. And deontology would come close to what in English is a code of ethics. You know you belong to a professional association of any, any profession or, 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 or commercial activity even, you get a code of ethics. Things that you should do and thereby things that you shouldn't do. Those would be deontological. Those belong to deontology. Um, and that can be on the level of the profession, of what's normally done. There would be the norms, if you remember what norms are. Okay, norms, what people expect you to do and what is usually done. Uh, they can be on the level of the academy, of people thinking about what should be done. And there it tends to become a more philosophical concern about uh, the variation. We saw when we dealt with norms, that different things are done at different historical periods and in different parts. So the profession tends to work on what we would call a deontological level. When you get to theories in the academy and the awareness that norms are culturally variable, it becomes more difficult to do that. We can't say something is done because it's just the best way to do it. We start to ask ourselves why? Why isn't it done differently? How could it be done better? And according to what principles? And that's when you move more into ethics uh, as such, which is a branch of philosophy. There's a reading that goes along with what I'm here to say. Andrew Chesterman, uh, a British uh, translation scholar who works in Finland, and he goes through the available ideas around on ethics or, and deontology, on what's good and bad, and he arranges them into four categories, and I think that's useful. Uh, for entering what is a very complicated discussion. Firstly, we find that a lot of the pronouncements in theories and in prefaces especially about ethics, about what should be done and should not be done, concerns representation. The, 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 the millennial discourse of fidelity is always fidelity to something. And usually it's to the source text. I represent what's in that text. And if you don't represent what's in the text, then it's supposedly unethical. And that would be an ethics of truth. The truth value of what you do, in that it represents another text. Is it a good theory? Of course it's not a good theory. Because if I go, um, uh, uh, well, the people at the back are not going to represent that as they interpret me, and they are thereby unethical. No, I don't think so. Uh, when we move through a text, we are often simplifying, explicitating, uh, getting rid of superfluous redundancies, in fact, improving a text, which might be ethical, but not according to an ethics of representation. So if you thought that was the end of the story, I'm sorry. It goes on. Remember, we talked about Skopos theory, the theories of purpose, the theories of, of translators doing something in the world. And uh, I might have mentioned in passing uh, the work of Christiane Nott, a German translation theorist who works within Skopos theory and says we more than just fidelity to a text, because we know translators often have to change the text. We need another kind of relationship, which she terms loyalty. You can be faithful to a text, but you're loyal to people. And she says, you must, you translators, interpreters, ultimately have to be loyal to the people you're working with. That is, loyal to the author, loyal to your receiver, your, your reader, or your audience in this case, or loyal to your client. There you enter an ethics of service. 
And that's the kind of professional ethics you find in service-based economies such as the United States is becoming. And most of your countries are becoming service-based economies. We don't sell things, we sell our time, we sell our human relationships, our expertise, our knowledge, and the ethics you get are the ethics of service, of the guarantee of the quality of what we say in our relationship to people. You see the difference. From fidelity, a truth value, you move to loyalty, which is a service value. Satisfying people in their needs, recognizing the needs, giving them advice, as well as translation. When we did that, we looked at Skopos theory, at theories of purpose and action. After that, we moved on, I think, to descriptive translation studies, and we dealt with norms. And there, I hope I convinced you that different cultures, different historical periods, have different ways of doing things. Okay? And that can be highly problematic for norms. It means that the kind of representation you have, or the kind of loyalty relationship you have, depends on where you are in history, and in which culture you are positioned. And if you're aware of extreme cultural relativity, which is what that is, it means nothing is universal, universally absolute, everything depends on where you are in history, and in cultures, how do you act? You can no longer make an appeal to something like best practices. Best practices says the interpreter has to render every word that's uttered. No. Best practices say the interpreter edits out superfluous material. Perhaps. But historically, you're going to have to say best practices is, is whatever the people involved expect you to do. This comes back to an ethics of trust and trustworthiness. Okay? Uh, if your audience expects you to edit out all the rubbish and just give the good stuff, which is what happens, for example, in the tradition of Les Belles in Fidèles, neoclassical French translation practice and theory, 17th, 18th centuries into the 19th century, just give us the good stuff. Don't render Homer, as a, the Homeric epics, as a big book. Reduce it down to something I can read. About 50 or 60 pages would be nice. Or the French at the end of the 19th century, the French were pretty good on this, uh, explicitly, I've got one translator who explicitly defends his translation of Tolstoy, War and Peace at coming out at one-third of the length. And he just says, Bah! It's too long for a novel. A novel has to be this length. War and Peace is too big. I've just given you the good bits. Okay? And at that place, in that place and time, that was what people expected the translator to do. He actually says, to Le Monde say, everybody knows the Russian novels are too long, so everybody reduces. And as long as they all know this, and they know it's happening, can we say it's unethical? The fact is, the readership trusts the translator to do it. The translator earns their trust by doing it. And Tolstoy is off in Russia somewhere, somewhere he doesn't care, so everybody's happy. All right? Norm-based ethics. The virtue, if you go back to classical theories of virtues, you know what a virtue is? It's the good thing you develop in your life to lead a, a good, virtuous life. It's really Latin philosophy based on Greece. But the virtue here is trustworthiness. A good mediator, translator, interpreter, develops trustworthiness. As opposed to loyalty, which could be blind, you're loyal. A dog is loyal to you. They'll never leave you. Yeah. You could be a really bad person. You could be loyal to a very bad person. Is that very ethical? Okay. Uh, or, uh, or truthfulness, which would be the virtue for the first paradigm. Can you see how this becomes an interesting discussion? 
to have three virtues. All virtues are good. And Chesterman, uh, finally, and obviously if you give four things, the fourth one, the last one is what he thinks is the best one, uh, elaborates uh, an ethics of communication. He says all, these other, all that other stuff, the fidelity, the service, the norm base, doesn't really help us decide what to do. And he, he um, brings out a very neat philosophical trick that I'll explain to you. It comes from Karl Popper, um, an Austrian philosopher of science. And Popper was worried about this, about the ethics of science. Uh, how can you tell people to achieve something good? He looked around and saw this cultural relativism. Each culture has a different idea of what's good. And, and Popper said, well, that's positive ethics. Everybody has a different idea of what's good. But Popper makes the interesting observation that throughout humanity and across cultures, even though we disagree about what's good, there's a lot of agreement about what is bad. For example, human suffering, pain, loss, starvation, early death, things like that. All cultures will very quickly bring out a list of bad things and agree on them. So Popper developed what he calls a negative ethics. Not looking for things that are good, but avoiding things that are bad. You can find this, you know um, the Hippocratic Oath, medical doctors, physicians, swear an oath, which is a code of ethics, from Hi Hippocrates, is that possible? Yes. Hippocratic, I guess it is, Greek medical, no. and the first principle is, do no harm. Do no harm. Whatever you do, don't make it worse for the patient. You may be a quack, you may be somebody selling false remedies, placebos, whatever. That's okay, as long as you don't make the situation worse. That would be negative ethics. Number one, don't make it worse. Okay. Chesterman looks at translating and interpreting and says, well, how could we apply this? He says, well, everybody disagrees about what truth is. You could disagree on loyalty and trust is a relative virtue after all. It says, well, what's the equivalent of suffering in communication? And he says, suffering in communication is misunderstanding. Avoid misunderstandings. This was his number one recommendation. Even if you don't know what that person means and you don't really know what that person wants, you can still do something like avoid misunderstandings. For example, it might be ethical for you to say, I don't know, I don't understand, or be quiet, <laughs> okay. do no harm. Interpreters, if you don't know what I'm doing, just be quiet, please. <laughs> don't take a guess. Most people do, though. <laughs> Next week I, I deal with risk management. This is part of when you can and do take guesses. But the negative ethics would be just stay with what will minimize misunderstanding. Now, Chesterman actually, actually believes in cross cultural understanding. He does say from there translators, interpreters should strive for cross cultural understanding. Personally, remember we talked about deconstruction. We talked about indeterminism, we talked about gather guy. Personally, I don't believe there is any understanding. I don't believe we ever get to understand ourselves, let alone our spouses, our children, our mothers and fathers, and colleagues in class and in other cultures. No, that, that, that's too optimistic. But we can minimize misunderstanding, and I will agree there that the negative ethics has a lot to do with it. I don't go into understanding. I, I stop at the level of achieving understandings. You know, it's, if you're not a speaker of English, it's quite hard to grasp. You know, 
We understand each other. Do you understand me? Yes, you understand me. Do you know? Okay, that's fine. But to have an understanding with someone is quite different. It doesn't mean you agree. It doesn't mean you have perfect um, synthesis in your or coherence in, in, in your ideas. It just means I have an understanding that you can go off and do things in that area and you'll allow me to go off you know, a, a modern liberal relationship with your husband or wife might be something like that. <laughs> you know, we have an understanding that my wife is going to get, take care of some parts of the house and I'll take good care of other parts of the house. And it's not a written contract and it's not anything. It's just an understanding. And a lot of what we do in life is based on that. Not understanding the other in any deep sense or understanding what they said. But an understanding that we are going to get along in life uh, allowing leeway to the other person and asking for some leeway for ourselves. Uh, that kind of understanding, I think, is what we get in many, many situations in international relations as well. Ethics of communication. I, I agree with reduced misunderstanding. From there, if you can do anything better than that, good on you. What do we do when these four things clash? What do you do when loyalty to one party means you have to sacrifice part of the text? It suggests we need something a little beyond the, these four paradigms that are available. And I leave that there. Uh, I will suggest next week what I think might be the basis for, for an ethics and ethics of risk management, which is what most interests me at the moment. But here in this class, because you're all young professional translators and interpreters, I want to present some codes of ethics. I want to represent codes of ethics, the ontology, such as it exists around us, notably in the ATA. Okay, and that's, that's the list. <coughs> ATA, code of ethics. I will serve the best interests of my clients conducting my professional activities without causing or intending to cause harm. Ah, negative ethics, Hippocratic Oath, applied to the ATA. I will treat all my clients with equal respect, regardless of their origin, race, religion, gender, age, or sexual preference. Very noble American liberal code of ethics. I will represent honestly my whole dear. It's the American Tarot Association. If you go in to get your tarot, you know these cards? Tell you. They have codes of ethics. And they're not bad, okay? 80. Ah, yes, American Translators Association, we're here, okay. <laughs> Code of Professional Conduct and Business Practice. Note, it does not say ethics. Okay, it's really translating that concept of deontology. And business practices, which is significant, because that does not appear in the European Codes of Ethics. In the United States, it's quite legitimate to act ethically and make lots of money. Uh, Europeans have never been very good at that, apparently. <laughs> and their codes of ethics distinguish the two. Um, I was looking at the TAC, the uh, Translators Association of China, which has a very elaborate code of ethics. Uh, it too deals a lot with business practices. Okay, so some cultures separate money from ethical practice. Other cultures recognize that they come together. Number one. <coughs> As a translator or interpreter, a bridge for ideas from one language to another and one culture to another, that's good, that gives a definition of what we do. A bridge. I commit myself to the highest standards of performance, ethical behavior, and business practices. Well, yeah. Why not? As long as nobody's saying what you mean by highest. Fair enough. Uh, my problem here is, what's the good of a bridge? 
if you just get walked over. 